Well, good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started here. Thanks for coming to our presentation of uh, Help Me Help You. Uh, my name is John Jones. I'm with uh, Martinez Construction. We're a 8A woman-owned general contractor located in uh, Central Florida. Uh, we also do work on the West Coast. We have offices in Northern and Southern California and also in Tucson. Uh, so appreciate you guys coming here today. Uh, introduce the panel uh, quickly. We got Jesse Crawford Mancini from the uh, Corps of Engineers Mobile District. He's a resident engineer. Uh, Commander Roland de Guzman. He's with NAVFAC Mid-Atlantic. He's a public works officer at Naval Support Activity Mechanicsburg, Philadelphia. It's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, and finally, Lieutenant Commander Jonathan Rebuck. Uh, he's with the U.S. Coast Guard, New Orleans Sector uh, Logistics Department right here in New Orleans. So he, he had the shortest drive of, the, of all of us. So anyway, we, uh, I've said it to before to you guys individually, but thank you. We appreciate the help we're getting from these three guys, and uh, hopefully we'll get some great information today. Um, so the logistics to start. Silence your phones. Everybody knows that. There's your warning. Um, our sponsors, obviously these, these uh, conferences don't go off without the uh, support from our sponsors. So if you get a chance and you're down in the uh, exhibit hall, make sure you're thanking anybody who's been a sponsor. Uh, there are PDH credits uh, for this uh, session. You get one credit if you didn't get scanned coming in, get scanned coming, going out. Um, and then I think you go online to pick up your certificates for that. I think you guys get them too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's good. I didn't get scanned coming in. Uh, we'll do Q and A at the end. Uh, we're going to try to leave time for uh, plenty of question and answer. Uh, we're hoping that this presentation spurs some questions that you guys will have. Um, so we'll do that at the end. I think there is also a survey at some stage, or you can go online for a survey. So please do that. Um, and then uh, all the presentations will be available uh, in PDF on the SBA, SAME website. And they're also audio recording all of the presentations. Um, so let me just go by script here. Lastly, as you've heard, the session is being audio recorded. As such, if you'd like to ask a question, we ask you to raise your hand, wait to speak until someone comes to you with a microphone, state your name and company, and ask your question to the mic. Um, don't speak too quickly. Uh, we'd like your question adequately captured. Uh, recordings are available for free to all attendees, and you'll get an email on how to internet that uh, after the conference. So I think that's a new, a new twist to these. All right. Since we came up with the name of our presentation. Help me. That was easier because usually I'm really bad at jokes, so I figured that was an easier way to do that. Um, so why are we here today? So the, the genesis of this uh, presentation and our idea of coming up with this panel um, came from a uh, PPQ we got, Martinez got, from one of our Navy projects. It was a pretty you know, technically unremarkable project. Um, doing uh, re hazardous material remediation and demolition of a project for the Navy in Southern California. We got done with the project. We uh, were going after another contract, needed a PPQ filled out. Um, so we sent that to the lieutenant, called him a week later, called him the second week, you know, getting ready for this proposal. We figured he's just busy. He, he, was, he was wearing many hats, and, uh, but he kept saying, no, John, we're going to get it to you. Just, I need some time on it. I need some time on it. Um, and then when we, got, we did get it to him, what, uh, what was kind of surprising to us and pleasantly surprising is he had actually done, not just filled out the, uh, the boxes on the PPQ, but had done a two-page write-up of how well we had done on that project. So we got that and then took that in the office and sat around and tried to figure out, okay, what, what exactly did we do on that project that was so successful and how do we replicate that? Um, 
we're going to start with pretty much, you know, if you're contractors in this room, we all know how to paint a wall. We know how to put paint on a wall. It's pretty rare any of us get a technical evaluation, either, you know, exceptional or really bad for, for what we do. So we're going to start with the fact that all of us here as contractors or architects or engineers or consultants, we're generally doing a good job. We're getting our projects done well. We're meeting the technical requirements. We're getting them done on time. We're getting them on, on budget. But really what we want to look at is, you know, what can we do then to differentiate ourselves um, in terms of communication and planning, interaction with the client, um, being flexible, understanding the mission of the client we're working with. That's really what we're trying to explore today. And it started with that PPQ. We've tried to replicate it a little bit in our office. Um, and so today we're, we're hoping to get some, uh, some of what we learned and then we'll get some information from the panel here that'll help us. Um, so how do we help? You know, our goal is to make um, our interactions with the client as productive and helpful as possible. So as a contractor, you know, we want to look at how do we provide correspondence that's easily understood, not just to our direct client, but then to their chain of command. Um, how do we uh, provide requests that can be easily answered? So how do we tailor the questions we have so that we're, we're allowing for easy and quick response? Um, you know, how do we provide all of the information that's needed? If we need action uh, from our client, you know, we want to make sure that we're providing all the information for them to act on the request. And then communication, you know, are we communicating clearly and often and concisely so that information is being provided to our client um, for them to do that? Um, really, the bottom line, what we're trying to, what we want to talk about today is how to be intentional about what we do to make our clients' jobs easier, so that their job, if their job is a little bit easier, then our overall project's gonna go much better. Um, we introduced the panel earlier. Oh, sorry, we left this slide in here. I, I am just gonna mention that um, we had intended also to have one of our clients from Border Patrol come, uh, Harry Hart, but he was helpful in putting this particular presentation together. Um, so some of the topics we're going to talk about, we're going to go through and get some uh, information from the government clients that are hopefully helpful to, you know, how you guys can do your jobs. We'll talk about project administration, startup, uh, changes and change orders, project closeout, client interaction. And when we use client, I'll, I'll use the word client and owner kind of inter, uh, interchangeably in here. Really what we're talking about is their client. So the building user the building owner, um, the facility managers. Um, those are, that's the interaction that we're gonna focus on today. Um, and then finally, what's the, you know, what's the client's mission? What's, what is actually, are we trying to do in the grander scheme of things? I could have really used Semin uh, General Seminite's presentation, the end of his presentation yesterday, if you saw it. I almost, we wanted to kind of capture that last two minutes and just do that right here, and it would have saved me some effort. Yeah, um, but we didn't, we, weren't, we didn't know he was going to say that, otherwise we would have. Um, so I'll talk real quick. I'm just going to talk about project administration real quick. Uh, from our perspective, what we found out we did that was being uh, successful. Um, when we're talking about administration, we're talking communication, quality control, submittals, daily reports and photos, invoicing, you know, kind of the administrative part of our project. Um, so if we want to be intentional and we want to understand how we can help our clients execute the project, um, first thing you got to know is you got to know who the players are, right? So you got to understand that who the COR is, who's the CEO, who's the quality control from the government side on the project, who's doing the safety, um, and again, the user or owner that we were talking about. You got to understand how they communicate both in a formal and informal way really think about or pay attention to how that process happens while you're in some of the, some of the meetings. Um, and then an important one is what, what are the relationships look like between all of those people? Um, do they have cooperative relationship? Do they have a combative relationship? Um, do they, have they worked together and executed projects together before? Um, and then one that, that came up as we were having some conversations preparing for this is, you know, what do they know about what we do? So there's a lot of, you know, at times um, we've, we've had projects that were rocket scientists that knew a lot, but not about construction. Um, 
And at other times you have facility managers that used to be contractors, so they know maybe too much about construction. But paying attention to what they know about um, what it is we're trying to deliver is important because then you can help tailor your interactions um, to the client that helped that. And then finally, funding, you know, where's the money coming from? So some of the things we learned um, about project administration and think, keep things, um, make the projects go good is, you know, again, the communications, what are the formal and informal communication that happen? Um, we want to respect the um, formal lines of communication, obviously, but you want to pay attention to where you can help your client um, if they need to, you know, push schedule information over to the, you know, either to their chain of command or to the users. Um, you want to look for opportunities where you can, you know, step in and provide that information. Um, again, with their permission so they understand it, but, you know, those are things that help projects move a lot smoother. Um, and, and, you know, it seemed kind of intuitive to us, but again, it was something that was specifically mentioned um, on this particular evaluation we got is our email communication and how do you do that, All right? So find out very easy and be consistent, you know, whether it's project name or contract number, the line of that email, you've got a contract number, you've got a brief uh, description of what the email is about. And then finally, is it, a, is it just for information or is it some, uh, some particular thing that they need to act on? We put that in the line of the email. Um, I would guess you guys are probably up to, what, 200 a week, 200 a day in emails. So it's real easy for, um, what you want to do is make it real easy for your client to just look at the heading of that email in their inbox and know, one, what project is it, and two, is it something they have to look at quickly? Um, so that's one easy way where we know we can, we can provide the information without overwhelming them with, with emails that they know they have to look at. And then in those emails, you know, again, depending on the, the client and what they need, do they, want, do they want a novel to explain what they're doing? Do they want a short story? Do they want a, a poem or do they want a, a haiku, right? You want schedules delayed on rebar, come in next Tuesday, give me a call if you've got any questions, right? You know, or they might, may want the detailed explanation. But again, you have to pay attention to what, what works for that particular client and then tailor your communications to it. And then uh, don't cry wolf unless there's a wolf. We've all worked with the person that every email gets the red flag, every submittal is due tomorrow, every RFI is due ASAP. That, um, that's not helpful for anybody, obviously. No, um, one of the um, things you wanna do is, is wait for those issues that really are important and flag them. Um, and the more you, you know, wait for them to be really important, the more credible you'll be when they are important. Example I used when we were talking about this, we were doing a, uh, this is early in my career, doing some building in San Francisco, and I would go out there as a little young engineer, um, and every day the contractor and the rebar guys had questions about, okay, hey, we wanna do this different, we wanna do that different. Um, and generally, mostly because I didn't know, I would go back to the office and try to figure it out and see if it made sense. But there were times when I would say, no, absolutely not, you can't do that. Well, these guys, you know, were, were seasoned professionals. If they heard no from me right off the bat, it was a dead issue and it went away. But if I had said no every time, then that would have lost its power. So again, you want to be, you know, make things important when they're important, not every time. Um, and then the other thing that we find that's helpful cause is, is submittals and invoices, things like that is, is you know, we tailor the information as we're delivering it. Um, but more importantly, like forewarn the client that it's coming. If you know you got something that's important, uh, you got a particular RFI or submittal that has to get reviewed, you know it needs to get reviewed quickly, you know about it a week ahead of time, we let them know, say, hey, next Tuesday, I'm gonna give you a submittal for the lighting and that's critical. So, you know, now they've got in the back of their mind, Tuesday comes along, that's the day I got to look at the lighting. So rather than hit them with it and say, oh, by the way, this is due tomorrow, jump on it out of the blue. So those are some of the things we've used to, you know, again, just make sure that we're, um, you know, being intentional and paying attention to what the workload they have, because um, their workload's a lot, you know, is, is, is getting more and more these days. So the more we can help them execute their 
work, the better it's going to be for our projects. So that's my, that's my part and my explanation of how we were able to be successful. But the real startup uh, or the real information now, what we're going to do is, um, you know, we've got three of the topics we're going to go. I'm just going to go through and ask questions to the, these, uh, our panel here individually, let them answer. Hopefully you guys can pay attention, pick up a nugget here or there that will help you as you're going through it. Um, and then we're going to leave some time for Q&A at the end because hopefully we spur some questions here. Uh, so, Commander Reebok, uh, we'll start with Project Startup. So if you could tell us what's something that we as contractors should know or understand about what your job entails during startup. So um, Project Startup, I think um, ultimately if you're new to working with one of our organizations, it's a, it's, it's a very there's a steep learning curve. There's no school that we can go to. That we, most of this stuff is on the job, and I don't think I've ever seen the same project happen twice. So a lot of times there's a large learning curve or steep learning curve for both ourselves as the designers and the builders, or, and then as you as the builders. So um, the number one thing that I think that everyone can, can uh, really focus on is the, that, that project administration, um, the submittal registers. A KO, when you're a, a contracting officer, the Coast Guard calls them KOs, I think most other organizations yeah. call them COs, but in the, in the Coast Guard, our COs are commanding officers. So um, contracting officers um, send out a large package of information when you're awarded that project. And a lot of it is you know, just monotonous paperwork. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. But the two things that I am focused on, and really the only two things I'm focused on, are this middle register and the project um, schedule. And I have seen so many times that that project schedule comes in about a month after award. And that is a maddening thing because you can't have a pre-con without a project schedule. And then you're looking at a submittal register. And then all of a sudden you've got, you know, our clients, well, you told me this project was going to happen three months ago. And, you know, so it's a uh, it, it, that, that, those two things, I think, are the biggest focus that I don't think are enough, pe uh, enough attention are paid to. Um, on a submittal register, knowing each construction manager or project manager wants to see things a different way, when you sit down and you finalize that submittal register, it makes it clear. So that way you're not having 10 submittals come in and they're like, well, I want each one of these individually separate so that I can approve, deny. Or, or, or so forth. And, and it also helps to understand if that construction manager is also the project manager. If the construction manager and the project manager are the same, that submittal register process is, can go a lot smoother, which is, I was able to do that a lot more in California when I was working with uh, Martinez. So the, those, two, um, those two things that project startup, I think are the most important. It's, I think it's common sense, but a lot of people overlook that because they get overwhelmed with subcontractor forms that they need to fill out and a lot of that other detailed information that the, the contracting officer is looking for. Um, and then the other thing is I identify the, the customer. You know, a, a lot of people look at, at me as the customer and I'm not, I'm just, um, I'm managing the contract. And that interaction between the contractor, the customer, myself as the construction manager, the project manager and the contracting officer, most of the time, all in different locations in Coast Guard projects can get very confusing. And so you need to not only establish that with your, with your, with your staff, but also with your subcontractors, because some of them, are, they're just trying to get in and get the work done as fast as humanly possible so they can make, make time as money in most cases. I think those are the two, the two main things. Okay. Um, then... Um, those, that kind of read, that was yeah, okay. good. That's okay, yeah. that's all right. Um, Two for one, so what, what would you say is a typical mistake or oversight that contractors do during startup? So one of, one of the important, um, the, the typical mistake that I see that it really slows up the process is not using co the forms that the contractor and officer gives. And we were talking about this, our, our technology is very behind what the industries is because of, for a multitude of different reasons but you know uh, most of my offices don't have Microsoft projects so when we send out a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet with a schedule on it use it I know it, you can use two forms at the same time but that simplifies a lot of things for for not only the project manager and the construction manager but also the contracting officers because these contracting officers are managing 
probably between five to 10 contracts at the same time. And when they're looking, it's very hard for them to decipher. A lot of them have, con they don't have a construction background. They, they develop that when the time that they're in that office. So when they look at something, they're like, I don't know what it is, or they can't open it up. They just turn it back around. So not using those forms is very, they have their own submittal form, you know, and, and there's, I mean, these are set things that the Coast Guard uses every day, and that's, everyone knows that. And when you send that to a different, um, to, to a KO, and they look at it, I don't know what that is. They're just going to throw it right in the trash. So not using those forms. And then the other thing, too, is a, you know, establishing like a site superintendent and understanding what their authorities are, um, whether they can do no cost field changes, what it, what size, what what the cost of a no cost field change is for the Coast Guard. It, it's five hundred. It's five hundred dollars. It's not a lot, you know. But you can kind of finagle that. But sometimes I would go and I'd be on the site with the uh, with um, with the site superintendent. And I, I got to call back to the office and and run it through five different people, and it and it slows up a project a couple of days when it's and it comes back and yeah, we can just sign it. So those are the two things that I, I think. Ensuring site superintendents understand what decisions they can and can't make um, is, a, is a huge help and it ex really expedites a project. Great, thank you. Okay, Jesse. All right, I know everybody. You get the easy one. Seen, <laughs> I know everybody's probably seen this picture before, and it's uh, you know it's probably not the right. Probably not the right answer, but somebody has a really nice boat out there. Um, but uh, as far as contract modifications go, um, there there's a lot of things that go into this. And you know, really, the first thing is is when when something comes up that looks like it's a change, is you know, everybody needs to really sit down and take a look and make sure that really is a, a change to a contract or a modification is necessary. And going back in on, on complicated projects, sometimes you know, there's. There might be five or six documents and appendixes that need to get looked at to find out if it really is a change to the contract or not. So confirming the scope of the change and making sure that everybody's um, on the same page and there's a meeting of the minds of what that scope is going to be is really important is pro probably the first step. And making sure that RFP has the content in it that needs to be there and the right level of detail. And if it's got liability involved on the government side or liability is going to be pushed off onto the contractor determining right, that right mix. So um, that's something that's really important. And then um, one of the other things that the government is always going to do is they're going to perform some level of price analysis and price realism. Um, and it's kind of split up in, in two different things. There's certified and cost and pricing data that's been pushed up to two million dollars now for the Department of Defense and some departments are are working that at different levels depending on their <clears throat> depending on their thir thresholds and then two hundred thousand dollars now is kind of the limit where we look at kind of a serious um, price analysis where an IG is performed um, a formal IG is signed off on for uh, kind of the field office level where we have to have a formal IG prepared so that's something that's going on behind the scenes that, that we're looking at um, we're also looking for confirmation of the availability of funds for change orders, particularly where funds might be short, or if we're going to have to descope something as part of the project, as part of the change, in order to make that uh, make that change as part of the project. So, on O and M projects um, and S R M projects, where we have uh, where there's problems with funding, where there's li limits on funding, where that we can have, we'll um, oftentimes take a look at where that funding is going to come from. And then um, oftentimes project engineers or the, the ACO or the CORs are doing what's called a pre-negotiation objective memorandum and they're just basically laying out how that, how that, um, that negotiation is probably going to go with the contractor and their objectives of how they feel like that pricing should look. Um, so the, the one or two things that, that uh, contractors can do to help us out when processing the mods are um, as part of that scope confirmation is when you get the RFP, ask us questions if you don't understand it. Because oftentimes I know I'm in a hurry and I'll look at it real quick and we'll just give you just the um, kind of the, the very basic, you know, provide electrical outlet on this wall at this location. But sometimes that detail is missing 
that you need in order to go into it. You'll need to go into that space or it could be a secure space and you need to go and see it or you need some feedback from the, the our clients or the public works folks in order to get that information. So ask us the questions that you need in order to help, help us out um, in order to get that pricing right because we're gonna ask you to give us detailed pricing information back as part of that proposal. And then also following the instructions that are provided in the RFP, um, we'll give, I know for our district and a lot of the USACE districts, it, it just spits it out of RMS. It's already, already part of the process. We're gonna ask you to give us a, um, a detailed information down to the subcontractor level. But if you need to go back and, and look at some of the information as far as contracting for negotiation, or as part of negotiations, it's in, it's in FAR Part 15. And then DFAR's contract clause uh, 252-236-7000 is modification proposals for um, price pick breakdowns. There's a lot of good information in those sections about how to generate that information. And then also, you know, some of the things that John was talking about, there's, um, uh, there's forms that are sometimes given as part of your contracts that we ask you to, to adhere to or as part, of the R, as part of your RFPs where it'll ask you to generate labor, materials, equipment, that type of detailed information that we want to be able to see and analyze as part of your proposals as well. So, and it, it depends on if it's an A proposal or if it's, if it's a construction proposal. So. It just depends the type of work that you're that you're taking on, and then um, as far as the question where it um, the mistakes or things that that we like to see is when you're making uh, submittals for your for your modifications. Um, it's uh, basically we want to know about those things that become that could be coming up as problems in a contract that could be generating changes because if we get time growth in a contract or there could be a last minute request for equitable adjustment that you're thinking about submitting. We wanna know about that when you start to think about submitting it because we wanna be able to inform our client that this could be something on the horizon that we could start to get to see a cost on later. And that can help us kind of prep them ahead of time for those type of impacts. Because what happens is, is sometimes at the end of the project we'll get two or three REAs for something that maybe I had to direct work on or something like that. And that can negatively in, impact our, um, our relationship with the client when they're out there and they may not have a lot of funds for O&M work or SRM work and they have to go out and go reprogram things um, or go request funds from higher headquarters and things like that. And they'll come back and they wanna know, hey Jess, why did you do this? What, what's going on? So. There's a lot of questions that come back and that can kind of impact our relationship with them. And there's a lot of questions and, and uh, things that our, our project management folks need to go back and rework as far as the funding stream goes to make sure that we can cover those types of changes. But um, that can definitely help us out. If you guys know that there's something that, that, that could be coming up or there's time issues on contracts, we want to bring that up as far as the partnership goes and, and make sure everybody knows about it in advance. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Okay, Ron, you want me to pose a question? Sure, for you? go ahead. <laughs> okay. So what's something that we as contractors should know or understand about what your job entails during closeout? So I, I could talk about project closeout for hours. Uh, I'm the public works director at a Navy base in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and I don't just have construction managers work for me, and there's, there's a point to the story, so, so bear with me. <laughs> I don't just have the, the construction managers work for me, I also have the asset managers and the shops folks who actually do repair work, small scale repair work on our buildings, so I care about the whole life cycle. Um, of, of our facilities. And so that's what we're talking about here when we talk about project closeout. It's, it's really the unglamorous work of cleaning up after the parade. Um, at a ribbon cutting, everybody wants to be there. Everybody wants to be in the picture. They want to hold the golden scissors. Uh, but that's not the end. It's, maybe it's the beginning of the end. But there's a lot of work that goes 
into a contract afterwards. And a lot of times, your success as a contractor can live and die by how you perform after the parade, how well you clean up after the parade. So something you should understand to, to get it down to brass tacks, again, unglamorous, we're gonna talk about DD 1354s, another form, right? Um, but when the federal government um, pays you to do a, a construction contract for us, we're buying a service, we're buying a product. The 1354 is the receipt, and we need it to be accurate especially in these days of audit readiness, uh, the 1354s are even more important than they used to be. And uh, bad on me, I didn't know what a 1354 was until uh, a very recent, very <laughs> recently, more recently than I care to admit, but uh, it is important for us to close out projects correctly. Um, so that's something that you should understand. There's paperwork that supports all of that, and most of it ties into the 1354. Okay. What's one or two things that we as contractors can do to help you during your closeout? So uh, one thing that I, I try to tell people is it's projects are, are marathons, they're not sprints. And you gotta keep up with the work, the administrative work throughout the contract, throughout the project, not cram it in, not sprint at the end. And so things like as-built and red line drawings and uh, O&M manuals, things like that that you should be keeping up with every day. You take 10 minutes at the end of the day and you make sure that the stuff you did that day is documented uh, because in, if, if, there's, if there isn't a document, it didn't happen. So I would, I would say uh, one thing, that's one thing you can do. Another thing is I would tell people uh, not to drop your pack, uh, to use some army terminology. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> um, it is easy to get focused on the ribbon cutting, to get focused on moving people into their new building because it's happy. It's, it's got the new car smell. It, it makes everybody enjoy the project. But finishing it out is just as important, especially because it's important to your reputation as a, as a contractor. Uh, coincidentally, we as the federal government, we're probably doing your CPARs at the same time. So there's some incentive to, to, being, uh, to prosecuting the paperwork uh, effectively because the site picture that we have of you is based on what you did for us recently. And that stuff happens more recently than the ribbon cutting. Excellent. Um, so what's a typical mistake or oversight that we make during the closeout? Uh, a typical mistake, and, and at first I was going to say dropping your pack, but uh, kind of related to that is it's very easy to focus when you're in the red zone, when you're about to finish a project, it's very easy to focus on the end user because you're talking to the end user a lot more than you were at the beginning. Uh, you're, Cause you're setting up for the ribbon cutting, you're setting up schedules for people to move in, things like that. Uh, but you can't lose sight of who you're really supposed to be working with, which is your, your KO, your contracting officer. Uh, because that's the person who's writing your report card, that's the person who's uh, signing your invoices so you get paid, and uh, it is easy to, uh, to take your eye off the ball there. And so you got to keep reminding yourself uh, about the important but not urgent things like paperwork. Excellent. All right. So again, we've, we've, I've used the word owner um, client. Um, again, here we're talking about the end user that Roland was just talking about. That's who we're focusing on here. So, so the owner is whoever is uh, really paying for this facility that these guys are trying to execute their project. So, um, I'll go back to you, Jonathan. Again, we'll, um, you know, if you can think about some good or bad examples of how um, a contractor or a consultant has affected your work working relationship. 
with the client. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll focus on the good. Um, my wife tells me I'm too negative. So um, I'll tell you, the first, uh, the first project I ever worked on, I, I walked into an office in CU Miami, and they said, here's a project. It was awarded. It's still the cleanup of Katrina. So um, I get this project. I would never looked at it before, but it was basically a bunch of electrical and mechanical type work that I was not that familiar with. So um, not only like, and then two days later, I get a call from the site superintendent um, and or the from the contractor, and he's like, "Hey, my site superintendent just got in a car accident, and I have to remove him." So I convinced this guy to come out of retirement to come back. So I was like, "Okay, you know that's that's good. I don't even know what's going on right now. I don't know where you are on the project." And uh, so two days later, I think, or that Monday, I get a call from this this site superintendent. He's like, "Hey, I kind of got a mess over here." But uh, I need you to come over because I'm looking at these drawings. I'm looking at everything over here. And some of it's just not making sense, and I want to make it easier for you. So I was like, okay. So um, I fly over to Gulfport, and I fly into New Orleans and drive over to Gulfport. And I had no clue what I was getting into. And I walk over to Gulfport, and we have this brand new, beautiful station. Um, the Coast Guard doesn't build brand new, beautiful stations very much um, until they get destroyed by hurricanes. Um, and so I walked on this project, and uh, this company had. They, it was a $400,000 project, and most $400,000 projects, you don't see a, a contractor working in, in the Coast Guard. You don't see them working out of an actual Connex box office, or they're, they're typically working out of their truck to save money or because we don't have room on our facilities. But I walked up there, and the guy said, come walk in my office. I walked in his office, and he had full-size drawings of the entire project right there, and we walked through it, and he had done he had marked up red lines of what the guy did before him and he was trying to get all this paperwork done and he had all this he had a submittal registry of everything that was out there all in paper and I like paper because I'm not I'm very bad with electronics and I don't I never come with a computer I come with my phone um, that's what the Coast Guard kind of gives us so for him to be able to lay it all out there in paper and uh, for us to sit down and review it what's been done what we need to do his recommendations for how to make this a little bit user friendly and also easier for the in the long run, I guess for maintenance, what, it was like it was a phenomenal experience, um, and that was kind of what my expectation was going forward. So, you know, not to focus on the negative, but I, I don't. There's not many times that I've had that, but that made a huge impression on not only myself but on the end users who used it. And ironically, I come back now and last fall, you know, it came back to haunt me because here we have a storm that floods Station Gulfport and I'm right back looking at the red line drawings that I looked at um, in 2009, I guess it was. So um, it was, I was very thankful that we did that and I, there's not many projects that I can say that, that uh, I've, I've worked on that have, have been that detailed. And it does, but it does take time and it does take an experienced site superintendent who, who knows what their what their powers are or what they can and cannot do in that relationship. So I'll keep it at that. Thanks. All right, Jesse. Okay. Well, I mean, I think everybody could probably tell lots of negative, you know, bad stories about, you know, things, but I, you know, my, I think one of the things that probably had a, a profound impact with, on me was, uh, it was a about $160 million military construction project. Um, and uh, the partnering team from really all angles, from the, the PDT and the, the government and the, the contractor side um, was, uh, and it did, it got the PDT of the year award for USACE uh, for the Air Force Technical Application Center um, and, and a couple other DBIA awards and uh, industry awards. But it's, um, I think that uh, the partnering that you can generate, if everybody is kind of dedicated to getting out of the weeds every once in a while or the everyday kind of grind of some of that negative negativity that you pick up from you know this the submittals this is wrong that's wrong you know you didn't put this in the wrong the right way once you get out of that and kind of have more of an operational mindset and a strate strategic mindset of what the end state is for the user or if it has a significant national significance or maybe you're doing something for you know SOCOM or you're doing something for the Air Force Special Forces or you have something that's uh, you know s significant for the project or you put a focus on that I think that that can kind of build 
kind of a strong, a strong teaming uh, environment. And that's something that, you know, that we took away as part of that team is always once a month, we, we went back and said, what were out of the, out of the weeds, what were some of those um, challenges that we overcame that month? What were those change orders that we took care of, the RFIs? And everybody kind of took the time out to say, okay, we got out of the weeds, here's the significance of what we've done that month. And um, I think that that was uh, something that was kind of really important to just take that time out of the, the schedule and just kind of get away from everything for a little bit and um, focus on that. So we were able to uh, kind of foster that environment to just give each other the pat on the back, get out of the weeds for a little bit and uh, focus on the positive, you know, so I, I think that helps. Good. All right. Roland, good or bad example of how a contractor affected your working relationship with your client? Um, I'm not going to go into the, the specifics of, of a given project, but I, I want to talk about the, the overall relationship and how it can, um, how it can ripple in, in ways that you might not necessarily think of. So Naval Sea Systems Command is the systems command for the Navy that handles all the technical and acquisition issues for uh, the Navy's at sea assets, submarines and ships. And uh, they do a lot of things, uh, certainly a, an important part of the Navy, um, industrial and research and, um, and engineering and service engineering work. Um, when it comes out to the Navy bases, we have four shipyards that are four of the, the most important hubs, field components, field offices of NAVC. Um, and I worked at one of the shipyards. And one thing that, uh, and this, this goes into uh, what John was saying earlier about knowing your, knowing your end user and knowing your client. Um, the, the contracts that, at, that we provided for uh, Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth, Virginia, um, and the way we prosecuted those projects, the way we briefed them to the end users, and the way we uh, held our contractors accountable, all of that, good and bad, really informed the shipyard, and by extension, uh, NAVC is one of those flat organizations where uh, information flows very rapidly from me out in the field looking at a 30-foot geyser of a water beam that broke to the three-star admiral at the Washington Navy Yard, who's the head of Naval Sea Systems Command. Um, but what I didn't understand at the time was how our performance in administering that contract or those contracts really informed NAVC's opinion about contracting as a whole. And so if you find yourself working at, uh, at a base that is a, a hub or a center of excellence for that service or, uh, or that agency, that, that's one thing that you wanna keep in mind is that you're showing the flag for the contracting community uh, for that sector of the Navy or that sector of the Army or wherever you happen to be working. And um, the, that's something that doesn't necessarily come to mind uh, at first glance until you actually live through it. And so that was one thing that I wanted to share. Good point. Okay. Um, so we talked... Um, so wrap up, wrapping up some of what they've talked about, I think all three of you have mentioned a little bit about, you know, um, the importance of the work that we're doing. Um, again, one of the things that's important to, to think about and approach your projects that help, help kind of inform all of these decisions is knowing how that project falls into the grander scheme of things. Again, I, I could just use Seminite's, uh, General Seminite's speech yesterday and talk about strip malls and whether you want to leave, you know, a legacy of strip malls or not. Um, but what I'd say instead is what we do, the people in this room and at this conference, what we're doing is much bigger than that. Um, example I use, you know, we like to talk to the end users. We try to do it in a way that's not um, 
negatively affecting our, uh, our CORs, our uh, COs work. Um, but we were, um, we were doing some road work for Border Patrol. Again, a fairly unremarkable, about seven miles of dirt road that went up through the mountains in San Diego. Um, the, the road was in pretty bad shape, but they used it a lot. That was one of the reasons it was in such bad shape. So we were up doing some recon before we started doing the work. Um, one of the agents came rolling up on us, and, and as we were sitting up on top of this mountain looking at the work, um, just asking what we were up to and what we're doing, and we started to explain to him that, um, you know, we're getting ready to re regrade this road, we're bringing in some new base rock, put some soil stabilization in, fixing the drainage problems, you know, making it a smooth road. Now, I would have expected that his reaction was great. That, you know, it just makes my life a little bit easier. But no, his reaction to that was, oh my God, thank you. Um, because he traveled that road probably three or four times a day, as did, you know, 50 other agents. And almost to a person, every time they had to do that, they were scared they were even gonna go home that night. Because um, the road was in such bad shape, it was going through some pretty treacherous mountains, um, cliffs on one side going down into Mexico, um, and a lot of traffic that went in through there. So they're, they're, they really uh, were concerned about just going home at night. So again, that's, that's something that's, you know, we, we were just doing a road, but, but understanding the importance of what we were doing and why that particular project was important really changed our approach to that project. Um, but most of what we do is, again, as a collective group at this conference, there's some important aspect to that work that you need to take some time and understand. And then once you do understand that, um, communicate that, one, to your, to your team. Because, um, again, we had, we had a guy who was just riding a grader up and down, you know, some, some of the hills of San Diego till I told him that story. Well, now he was coming to me every day and saying, hey, I can, I can make this part over here a little bit better. I can make that part over here a little bit better. And his work product was, was five times better than it probably would have been otherwise, just by informing him of the importance of what he's doing. Um, so kind of wrapping that up, again, what, you know, what we're doing is really important. What we do for the nation is important. So understand your clients and what's important to them. And, and then use that as you're executing your projects um, to make the projects better. With that, um, I'd like to leave some time for uh, any questions, anything else um, you guys have about how you're executing your project and what, what your duck work does and how it affects their, their job. Um, we'll go ahead and open that up to any questions. I think there's a microphone in the middle there. So if no one has any questions to break the awkward <laughs> silence, I'll, uh, I'll tell you, you only asked me for one or two things for project startup, but uh, okay. uh, I, I cut it short. I had a, like a laundry list, right? <laughs> I don't wanna, I don't wanna, yeah, yeah, exactly. So now that we're here, um, no, so, you know, we, I talked about the forms. It's the, it's the simple little things, but you know, a lot of times I can't tell you, so I've had two, worked in two completely different offices. One. I was in CU at, at, in Miami, and I had projects that were Puerto Rico, Great Inagua, you know, all these remote places. Mm -hmm. And then my contracting officer was in the in the office with me, but my core, my contracting officer's representative, was somewhere else battling 50 million projects. And then I flip over and I work with with Martinez and John, you know, and I'm in an office where I'm only focused on 880 acres. And it was really nice because I did the design work. I did cradle to grave. And doing it cradle to grave helped me understand so much more about what was going on. But what you have to understand when you do a submittal and you're, most, of, most of the people in this room will, be, will, have, will not have that opportunity to work with somebody on a cradle to grave. That's a, those are very unique situations. There's only like two of them in the Coast Guard. So um, when you, when you in the, sending that email with the contract number and the submittal number and that stuff, what happens, what you don't see is that you goes to the contracting, the contract manager who then literally hits forward, probably doesn't change anything in the subject line and sends it to a project manager. 
That project manager may or may not get to it, but doesn't know what he's looking at because he doesn't really have a relationship at all with the contract. So he's not it's not registering to him that it's coming from John Jones or somebody at Martinez because it's just a, it's a, it's a name of a project to him or a project number. So when you put those things in the subject line so that we can literally just press forward over and, and get it get it going to the five other people that needs to be reviewed by, then back to us. That's seriously, I mean, that cuts down on time so much. But um, the, the one other thing that I was um, thinking about too was that submitting RFIs, right? When you're talking about a project, um, RFIs are probably, I think, the most underutilized tool that contracting officers give to contractors. It is a formal way of communicating. Some, some just use email. There's others that, you know, you go through the form. It really depends. But on those RFI forms that we have that are extremely helpful is when you submit and you, there's a box on there that says, is this going to cost the Coast Guard money or the government money? And if you click no, you're going to get a lot faster response, right? And I'm, not saying that, <laughs> and I'm not saying that that's always the case, right? But I mean, but when you're put, when you're submitting those RFIs, like it is, a, it's a mindset, especially at the beginning of a project. If you're submitting an RFI, and it's automatically it's saying yes, it's going to cost more money. You're going to get you're going to get scrutinized harder than any. And I'm not saying that that you, you shouldn't do it because there's plenty of times where we miss something on a design that you know. But hopefully that's caught in the solicitation process and put in an RFI and then an amendment prior to the award of the contract. But it doesn't always happen. So the, that RFI, click on that yes or no, it's not going to cost money. Do, I mean, I'm not saying if it's going to be honest, right? But um, a lot of people just leave that blank and then we're sitting here, well, what are you actually looking for, right? It's not clearly stated. And RFI, the RFI forms that the Coast Guard use is very clear. Um, anyhow. Excellent. Jesse, anything on project administration you want to add? I, I really, I mean, there, there's all kinds of things that, you know, that, <laughs> that can come up. I mean, for those of you who are working with USACE, I, I don't know uh, how many out there that are working with USACE or want to work with USACE, but uh, as many of you know, it switched from the old RMS system to RMS 3.0. It's a web-based uh, platform where most of the contract administration is done. Uh, almost all the documents now are electronically uploaded and submitted. It's a little bit more friendlier than the older version. Um, and so we're hoping to make some, uh, some improvements to the system as far as uh, how, how things are running that way. But I think that you'll find once you get in there that things do tend to flow a little bit easier because um, uh, the folks that are looking at your submittals and stuff are able to do that electronically now versus all the paper being shuffled back and forth. Looks up. Like. Roland, you want to add anything to admin? Um, someone told me in grad, grad school that contracts are documents that are written in peacetime but used in wartime. And uh, I, I sometimes am reluctant to use that because uh, because I know the, the seriousness of what we do, but the, the core principle is still the same, right? We, we write contracts so that we can hold ourselves accountable, but it shouldn't take the contract to hold ourselves accountable. We should be able to hold ourselves accountable just by our words and our deeds and the way we interact with each other and the relationships we build, which brings, brings us back to uh, one of the first things that John talked about. So if we find ourselves writing uh, long dissertations, getting in letter writing campaigns, um, that's, that's when you should stop and take a deep breath and, and figure out if, if what you're doing is, is right. And maybe that's, you've just built it to that stage and you just have to finish it out. But uh, that's one thing that, that I think is important to keep in mind is uh, the paperwork is important, and, and that was what I talked about for the for the most part. Uh, but the relationships that support that paperwork are are just as important. Excellent. It makes the paperwork go much smoother. Okay. Again, any any questions? Anyone that raised anything else? No. It must be late in the day. 
Good. We're standing it's late in the day. Everybody in, in Bourbon Street. Okay. It's New Orleans. Uh, happy hour is going on downstairs, booth 1057, if you haven't gotten your picture taken yet and see the big Space Coast block party down there. Uh, thank you guys. I'll say thanks again. I appreciate these guys coming and joining us in this uh, presentation.